Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the special library board meeting for March 2nd, 2021. It's seven o'clock in Weathersfield, Connecticut. Um, and it's a special meeting just because we had to change the date. Um, but otherwise, we are having a, this is our regular agenda. So we'll kick it off with public comment. Uh, any that we, I don't see any members of the public, anything come in through the mailbag? No, nothing through email and nothing in uh, snail mail, neither. Okay, okay, moving on. Uh, any additions or changes to the agenda? Anything? Okay, then let's look at the minutes um, that came through. Um, can I get a motion to accept the the minutes, anyone? I'll move to accept. Okay, George second. and Amanda as a second. Um, any, anyone have any changes or additions, anything? I didn't see anything. We all good? All right, we gotta go around the horn for a vote. Um, so uh, Michelle? Yes. Yes, uh, Lori, are you? Yes. Are you abstaining? I'm abstaining because I wasn't here. Yeah. Amanda? Yes. Uh, George? Yes. Peter? You're abstaining. Yeah, I have to abstain. I wasn't there. Yeah. And then Alma, yes. Okay. Good. Okay. I'll set with that. And then uh, we welcome Kevin, who came back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're glad to have you on board <laughs> once again. So, uh, What's the uh, what's the good word, Kevin, from town council? Um, it's been, it was a, kind of a quiet month on the council. Not too much in terms of uh, council action on items. Um, you know, we made some appointments to various boards and commissions, and had some actually pretty interesting uh, uh, presentations. One actually made last night by uh, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection on uh, municipal pay as you throw programs about having folks come in and basically uh, how you get rid of waste and refuse within the town, uh, which was pretty interesting. I, don't, um, I think we might be exploring some sort of pilot project uh, with that in the future. And beyond that, I mean, really the only thing that is is uh, with Chief Citran coming off of administrative leave and uh, announcing his retirement upcoming this summer. So that'll be kind of on the docket as well for the council over the summer is finding his replacement. But other than that, pretty quiet month. Does anyone have any questions for Kevin? No. No? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of uh, the, my report, um, the one big thing that happened was we did actually have our article in Weathersfield Life. If you've gotten Weathersfield Life, we are in there. Um, it was a... <laughs> The headline of experts was a little reaching. We have Brooke as our expert, and then and then it was Brooke, and then me and Hannah. <laughs> so uh, expert Brooke, and then supported by Hannah and, and myself. But um, great article about you know the library being reopened and all the steps that have been taken. And so we appreciate um, that exposure and continuing to get the word out. Especially glad that um, the work work has done to get and the staff have done to um, get us reopen after our recent shutdown. Um, and that was, that's pretty much it. It was a quiet month for us as well. So I know we'll, we'll have more to discuss. We've had a uh, finance committee meeting and we'll come back around and discuss that in a little bit. So, so that's it for me. Um, Brooke. So um, to you. Uh, for the director's report, um, more, uh, governor Lamont's, um, switching up who's eligible for vaccines, um, being an age-based eligibility system, um, for lack of a better description, um, will probably really work to the library's advantage um, because we were anticipating not being able to have our names thrown into the HAD, into the VAM system, the vaccine system by the CDC. Um, for quite some time. And now um, a handful of my staff have already received their first shot. Um, so they've been eligible uh, 
bunch of staff uh, have um, also just scheduled their first shot. Um, and so that has happened. And then I'm hoping that by March 22nd, um, my age group will come up. And uh, at that point, about half our staff will become eligible to at least throw our name into the hat, even if we have an appointment in May for our first shot, at least we've been scheduled. So hopefully mo after most of, their, most of the staff have received their shots um, in the next couple of months, we are looking to reopen up a lot further, um, which would be great because I think it just kind of, you've been vaccinated. There's not much more to really do at that point, except continue to, you know, wear our masks, social distance, wash your hands frequently. So um, the staff are feeling a lot better that they're eligible, you know, just that they even meet that, that criteria of, the, of age. Um, so that's, that's been helpful, but it is a bottleneck because there isn't that much more vaccine <laughs> coming into the state of Connecticut. Um, so you know, but that it's it's good on the we're looking much better on the library front. But we we don't anticipate being able to have in person meetings or programs till the fall. I hope to have a fall book sale, but I don't know. Um, but we'll just you know kind of see how things go. Um, but that I think the mood of the staff has really gotten better over the last cu couple of days, and it's because a handful of them became eligible and are scheduled for like next week. Which is great. So yeah. Um, the I've got, uh, uh, scheduling. Are people coming in to use the computers to schedule? Because I'm hearing it's really so a handful of um, folks have come in, and it was when it was like the 65 plus or 70 plus, like the older. Right. And it was difficult because our staff. It was not like a website they were used to. And then sometimes it's asking people what medicine you on, or, you know, depending on what portal they're going through, whether it's like Hartford Hospital or through Vans. And so I think it was difficult for the staff to even help the person navigate um, because they were completely, my staff was completely not familiar with it. And then over time, you know, after a couple of weeks of that. Um, so, but we've seen an increase in traffic just in general including the computer use. So I would say like a month prior to our um, two week closure, you know, we were seeing over a hundred people a day. Now we're up to averaging about 130 people a day. I'm waiting for the February numbers um, to see if we're averaging a little bit higher, but we do feel like there's been an increase in traffic. Um, but again, we're encouraging grab your stuff and go. <laughs> um, we haven't really put out additional seating. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of, you know, I think it's good. I think it's good. But uh, we've been able to help those who've come in. Um, but again, it, initially when people were coming in, we were completely not familiar with that website. And I do know that the Social and Youth Services Department uh, under Kathy Bagley has been helping, uh, reaching out directly to Weathersfield residents that they know, you know, are part of dial a or part of the food bank or Meals on Wheels or anything like that. So they've been helping those individuals directly. And what I understand is they've been able to give out approximately 50 shots um, at the community center, but Charlie Brown, uh, the director of the Central Connecticut Health District has ordered more, but just doesn't receive more. Um, and I know that, um, you know, if there's leftovers, I know Kathy Bagley maintains a list of standbys of people that can just show up at a moment's phone call, like come by, two people didn't show up, we have two extra, so no, nothing's going to waste in Weathersfield, so that's good. Um, so yeah, we've, we've helped a few people, Martha, to really answer your question, so. Um, other positive news, I am pleased to announce that Ellen, um, our longtime children's librarian, she's been here for 17 years, is our new public services manager, the head of children's. Um, she started yesterday in her new position. So we're very, very, very happy for her. And um, Great news. yeah, looking forward to working with her in this new capacity. She's very excited. Um, so it's great. 
Um, today, uh, March 2nd, is Read Across America Day. I don't know if any of you know this. Um, and uh, Ellen and Bree um, actually participated by, conduct by conducting virtual read alouds for Highcrest. Um, so we're popping in and the kids are in school now, um, but they're virtually sitting there watching Bree and Ellen do a, a program. So it's, it's great that we're able to reach out, still can continue to reach out to the schools in that way. Um, and I know that in her new capacity, I know Sally Distoli, um, who oversees a lot of the, what the reading consultants do um, as the assistant superintendent has reached out to Ellen and they're, they're even planning to meet discuss ways that we can continue to collaborate with the schools. So that's, that's great. Um, IT, we've had a couple things with IT. We're going to need a new firewall. Um, I plan to purchase it in this current fiscal year um, is my latest uh, plan. Um, our, our consortium that we're a part of where we share a catalog um, has made initial plans to have their staff go full remote. Currently, they reside at the Windsor Board of Ed building um, or some part of Windsor's Board of Ed. Um, they have office space there, but now they're going to go full remote. Um, and a lot of libraries have their firewalls running through that place. We're one of them. Um, so we're going to look to, you know, bring it on premise um, and work with our um our contracted IT um, novice to make that happen. Um, so that, that'll be coming up here in the next few months as we rotate that. Um, I was also recently notified by the town's plumber that a small air conditioning unit that keeps our server space, our server closet, nice and cool um, because it should be very cold, like outdoors cold um, today, <laughs> um, will need to be replaced. And we're starting to remove excess of equipment um, out of that space so that they have the room to work and get that installed. Um, so that's um, another air conditioning unit that needs to be replaced, but that's a low co lower cost one. That's, I call it Mr. Slim because it's more of a wall unit um, than the bigger units that keep the building um, cool during the summer. Um, trying to get further back to normal, we've resumed our printing charges on this um, yesterday on Monday. Um, where the, we, instead of having, you know, a lot of free printing so that we didn't have to interact with the public so much to take cash and whatnot, um, we've op reopened our cash register up and the first two prints are free and then it's 15 cents after that. So we will be back, trying to get back more into the normal um, business of, of what we're doing here. Um, so that, that's working out and that's especially important since um, we cannot print everyone's tax forms or tax booklets. We can print a lot of tax forms, but we can't print everyone's tax booklets because they're quite big. Um, and the federal government has sent out the 1040s and the booklets, so we feel we have plenty of those on stock. The state is not sending anything to its community partners and many, many people are coming in asking for tax forms and booklets and they're just not gonna distribute them like flat out. They can contact and we give them the phone number to contact but then it has to be mailed to the person and the mail's a bit slower than normal. Um, so that it's, a, it's a problem because people are looking to see these resources that we normally have and we don't have anything. And so um, we're printing what we can um, but we can't sustain that ream after ream after ream of paper um, and toner. So um, they're making it difficult to pay taxes <laughs> like said, for, for a percentage of the population. And it's not that big of a percentage that pays their taxes through the, the printed documents anymore, if they print. Um, but a lot of people want to reference those documents. They don't feel comfortable online. Um, so, you know, that's important. And I know that the, you know, the tax help where even uh, social and use services, they try to offer AARP tax help um, for those who qualify. Um, it's very difficult to have those kind of appointments. And then it's difficult for people who aren't used to that environment to try to have a tax meeting online. Um, so, you know, Kathy Bagley's department's uh, dealing with that, but, um, you know, we're doing the best we can, but uh, we can't print everyone's tax booklets for them. It's just, it's not feasible. Um, 
we, uh, again, trying to get back to normal. We currently do not have any art exhibits um, up on our walls at this time, um, but we did just remove out of the display case our international dolls exhibit, um, which was wonderful. Um, and we hope to have that back when we have more traffic in the facility. Um, we think it, it's just a really nice, interesting uh, collection um, that uh, you know somebody had. And then we've just, that was removed. And then what's gone in the display case for the next couple of months is the Ukrainian eggs. If you haven't seen this display, it's absolutely just beautiful. Um, all these little Ukrainian eggs. And so um, that's been brought in. It's in for the next couple of months. Um, and so it's, it's really just beautiful. And, they, they, and they're already booked for next year. So we're <laughs> like, it's the one exhibit I really let go for a couple of months. I'm like, oh, it's so pretty. Um, and it brings me joy every time I walk past it. So are pleased to be offering that again. Um, and we're hoping to get the art walls, you know, back up as we have more traffic in the building so people can see it. Um, as far as uh, I, I fulfilled an information request uh, recently um, for information that the union request prior to negotiations, this is a typical request that comes in and they ask for updated job descriptions, updated pay scales. So all that information, I provided that um, during the past month, it is kind of a big, uh, big uh, request that they put in, but it's, they put it in uh, the same request every, every three years or so just prior to negotiations. And now I'm trying to work with Gary and Ken Plum, the town's labor attorney, Gary, the town manager, um, and Kim Plum, the town's labor attorney, so that um, we can settle on some dates so that we can start negotiating um, their contract. Oh, can you let in Hannah? I think she's waiting. Oh, admit. Sorry. Okay. There's Hannah. So we want to be able to... Um, begin negotiations, the contract expires at the end of June, and it would be wonderful to have a contract in place for July 1st um, and not to go beyond that. So that's where we are in the process. I'd say right now we just need to get some dates scheduled and we are, we're on track as, as far as I can tell. Um, so that's, that's good, but we are waiting for dates um, from, from our end. Um, uh, programming that has uh, recently occurred, we're well, is going on. Uh, currently, we have the winter reading bingo with children's, um, and now we have that posted on our website as well. Um, teen programming, uh, the latest thing that we have going on with them is for them to do a um, take and make of confetti candle shades to make those. Um, so we're hoping uh, kids come in for those. Um, adult programming tonight, we have a calligraphy um, program going on. We have a couple of upcoming genealogy programs that are part of us sharing programming um, ideas and expenses with other neighboring libraries so that we can offer a really robust um, series, um, but we're sharing the cost among a handful of libraries. Um, in the area. And we did this past month um, host a virtual art appreciation in February, and it was called Bending Towards Justice, African Americans as Subject and Creators in American Art. And it was done by a woman named Jane O'Neill um, of Culturally Curious. Um, and we hope to bring her back again she has some really, really interesting programs and you just learn a whole lot. Um, and so we feel that that program was well received, um, but we would like to do more and promote these types of programs even more. Um, and in some ways you can reach almost, it, it, for something like this, you can really reach a, 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 a much larger audience than we could in person. And um, I'm not sure if she's up in New Hampshire, but that would be a cost to like bring her down here, you know, for a one night program, but virtually. And the fact that you can show so many images online is interesting. So 
we, we hope to utilize her again if she's willing to, to join us again. So um, just some creative stuff that the, the staff are trying to uh, think of. And I know that there's a tea program of some sort at the end of the month. Um, and I'm not sure all about that, but um, I know Doreen signed up for it. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's going to be one of those programs. Um, <laughs> which means the public loves it. And I'm like, mm, <laughs> let's have the friends pay for that. Um, but it, they're just really re well received. And I do think it's something where people will learn a bit about tea. So I think it's, I think it's good. Good to uh, stimulate the, satisfy curiosity and stimulate the imagination. So, um, but that's what I have for my report, Martha. Any questions? That is exciting about um, being able to do. We were had, I think we were talking about this in outreach that we can, it, it has changed, the virtual programming has changed sort of going forward, what we might be able to do, you know, as in terms of, it's, it's like one of the things that might be a keeper, will be a keeper. Yeah. So, and the cost of the cost savings of being able to like get people from different parts of the country really who are experts and phone them in. It's interesting. Yeah. Good, all right, thank you. No questions, anyone? All right, um, so uh, we're gonna take a look at the, um, we're moving on to the budget. Um, we had a finance committee meeting on Thursday? Yeah, Thursday, um, where we looked it over um, and Brooke walked us through and she's gonna walk us all through it again, but um, it came away with the, the blessing of the finance committee. We can talk about it and I'll let everyone chime in after with thoughts, you know, with you know, their own thoughts. But I think our impression was in general, it, it's a very, um, I don't want, it, you know, you really kept a very slim budget here. Um, you, you know, you, you've really, you've done a great job here to hold the line on things, Brooke, so I know. Let's, uh, so why don't we take a look? So if we could start just with the current financial report yeah. for 2021, our current status as of this moment in time for our current year's budget, we are, it changed one percentage point since Thursday night for the finance committee, people who were able to attend the finance committee meeting. Um, and so that was, uh, on Thursday night, we were 62% spent out. On March 1st, we are now, uh, as of Monday, we are 63% spent out. By Thursday or tomorrow, by Wednesday tomorrow, we'll be at 65% spent out because payroll have, will have hit um, Munis. Um, but this is as of yesterday. So we're 63% spent out um, is where we currently are. Um, for for our budget um, and so how this is presented here is how we'll go into the proposed um, budget and so you want me to just go line by line just go right through it sure whatever works best all right it's probably a good idea and give people a chance to yeah so if you have in. any questions stop me because i'm looking at a piece of paper i'm not looking up <laughs> so i won't see you um, for salaries and wages, um, we're running a few thousand dollars less than the current fiscal year. Um, and so how that's happened is um, Ellen, someone like Ellen took Regina's position. Regina was at the top. Ellen didn't come in at the lowest. She came in the middle of the pay scale um, in order for a proper raise. Um, and then Ellen's position is now funded at step one. So that's kind of how that happened. And I have reduced um, by, uh, I wanna say over $20,000 are temp hourly. Um, one second. Uh, this current fiscal year, our temp hourly, so that's the non-union part-time staff, is, is funded at about two hundred thousand, and in the proposed, it's funded at one seventy-three, 
And that's to take into account um, that we just don't have as much traffic. We're not doing in-person programming that some of my part-time staff might have been doing. Um, and we don't see that dramatically changing in, 2020, in, in calendar year 2021. Um, I, I did fully fund Ellen, the children's librarian position, Ellen's old position. I did fully fund that at, at the first step. However, I do not intend to fill it till perhaps the fall. Um, we feel with our current staffing, tr the current traffic, um, and I'm including the full-time and the part-time staff that we have, we can cover the children's department. It is a position we feel is really important and that we do need. Um, but right now we don't see that we'd be filling that till perhaps the fall, but I need to fully fund it. And the reason is, is because next fiscal year, the following fiscal year, I can't make a jump on a librarian sal salary of a quarter of their salary. It just would be too much of a jump. Um, so that's why I'm keeping it the same, but you know, hopefully we'll achieve a little bit of a cost savings, you know, right there at the get go with that particular position. Um, but that's kind of why the salaries are running just a little bit lower. And I'm getting very, very specific of how many hours I'm scheduling the library, you know, Dan, the library monitor or some of my um, part-time pages. Um, I still have a couple staff furloughed um, that I haven't brought back, but if I don't have work, I, you know, I'm not bringing you back. So, um, you know, that's kind of where we are with that. So that's where the salaries are, where they are. Um, costs that I really don't have control over, um, employee insurance, and that's kind of thicker. Uh, and that went up over a thousand dollars. Health insurance ticked up. Um, and there's always a, you know, a couple of percentage points increase or so. Um, and again, that number can change. But one of the big things is, you know, my children, my head of children's was funded for one person's health insurance. The new head of children's is funded for two. And the children's librarian that we're looking to fill, I have to fund it full family. And a single is 10,000, the jump to full family is, is a $17,000 plus, and that's $27,000 to fund for full family health insurance. Now, a person coming in could be just, you know, a, a person who doesn't have kids or a spouse or anything like that, um, but you don't know that till you've hired them, you know, basically. You don't know that till their first day of work, and, um, you know, that's kind of what you know, happens. And then you would achieve that, that if they came in just as, a, you know, one person needing health insurance or no insurance, you would see that savings the following fiscal year is when you'd see that savings. But you have to budget in a certain way the first year. And as people retire, younger people are coming into the workforce and they're more likely to need more and more health insurance it is, you know, how it is if they have families and spouses and whatnot. And their kids haven't aged off like some of the older members of the workforce. So health insurance, it is what it is. Um, but it is a, sounds as though it is a low claims year. <laughs> Not a lot of people have gone in for, um, uh, you know, I won't say elective, but, you know, maybe they've put off their hip replacement or, you know, something like that. So um, we are self-insured. And so it's been a low claims year in general, so that it is, you know, lower than it has in previous years. So that's a positive. Um, and hopefully that will continue to stay the same and stay low. Um, but there was an increase in the health insurance. Um, the pension um, is currently at 160, uh, almost 161,000. And then the defined contributions around 18.4. Um, and the pension is being held up um, by less and less members, um, new hires um, get put onto the defined contribution. Um, but, uh, you know, the cost of Regina's pension gets transferred out of our department and put to a different department. So that's good for us, but for the town overall, not really making <laughs> a difference. So, um, but that's kind of how that it rotates off of 
off of my budget. Um, workers comp ticked up about three and a half percent is my understanding. So the gray line there is what I call personnel um, services, personnel cost. For the most part, I don't control a lot of that. It's contractually bound, um, but I can play with some of it. Um, and uh, especially with the part-timers, um, and I use them when I need them and don't when I don't, <laughs> you know, and so it, there is a, when I started, I, well, in the last few years, we were at about 250,000 funding for the part-timers. We're now going to be funding at 173 and we're still good. Um, but you have to, you know, your part-timers, you don't, you know, you got to give them raises because you have to stay competitive with other surrounding libraries or other jobs. Um, you know, and I, I still think that we are fairly competitive, um, but we're starting to hit wage compression with the minimum wage each year ticking up is getting closer and closer to some of my other part-time positions. It's not there yet, but it's, it's going to happen in the next couple of years. Um, but we want to stay competitive, but they got this past year, as all the staff did, um, a 2% pay increase this current fiscal year. So, you know, we're, we're doing right by it, but um, you know, then there's a cost. Um, so the, the personnel costs are whatever's above the line. Are there any questions about any of this? No. I'm looking at the screen, <laughs> my piece of paper. Okay, um, and then below the gray line is what I call other than personnel services. Um, and so here we've got copying and binding, um, 250, uh, that stayed the same. Travel training and dues is uh, 5150, that's remained the same. Um, recruitment, we don't even budget for that. We don't have too much. If we put an ad in the rare reminder, Town Hall very kindly picks that up um, if there's any costs associated with that. Um, and if I do, it's, it's a fairly negligible amount. Um, professional services is really um, uh, the board of directors insurance because you do have fiduciary responsibility. We're trying to make sure that we're covering you for any of that kind of stuff. Um, we do have to carry it. We do check from time to time. Do we have to carry this insurance? And we do. Um, so we budget about $1,000. It runs, it's currently running about not over nine hundred dollars, so we're still we're still good. Um, programs is running at fifty one fifty, um, and just because things are virtual doesn't mean it costs really any less. Um, the friends were very kind and, and gave us a thousand dollars that we asked for a few months ago, a couple of months ago, um, for the take and make and grab and go bags. Um, so, and then they fund the summer reading. And, and so, you know, those program costs, but this is for the rest of the year. Um, tech support services, um, nearly half of this, about 40 grand is for our shared catalog. Um, the rest is for databases that we pay for, subscription databases. So like Reference USA or what they're calling Data Axel, it changes its name all the time. Um, Ancestry, there's a cost to that. EBSCO databases, consumer reports, there's a cost to all each one of those. Um, and we do get discounts through um, either our, the library connection, which is the shared catalog, um, or through the Connecticut Library Consortium. So there's a bunch, a couple of consortiums the library is a part of, and they negotiate on our behalf. Um, and so we try to save money there. I can, I easily can spend over a hundred grand on this particular line without any problems whatsoever. Um, except I don't budget that much. So that, that's where the problem <laughs> fits in. Um, things like overdrive or hoopla, that's where I'm perhaps asking for um, Jane Showman money. Can we put money towards this? You know, um, so that's where I'm, but the, that's what that is included in that line. Um, custodial services, I increased by um, five grand. Um, and I decided to kind of keep that the same. Um, the Board of Ed custodial, when they came in and do their sweep through, because 
we've had a case or they do a really thorough cleaning, um, which has only happened a couple of times in the past year, fortunately. Um, that's actually being charged to my salary and wage line, um, which I'm able to absorb that up there. Um, but so some of the cost isn't being reflected, but we don't really do that. Hopefully we don't ever have to do that again to that extent. Um, but this is, this is our contractual custodial. Um, and we are doing, we just had the midday cleaner in today. Um, and I will be uh, checking with um, Charlie Brown, the director of Central Connecticut Health District of, you know, the surfaces and whatnot, what do you think? And, and, and to continue that, because it isn't really sustainable to do the level of cleaning we're currently doing. Um, and how necessary is that to continue that? Um, and so uh, I will be checking with him to follow through on that. But um, we, we've had to you know, pay for more cleaning um, and the midday cleaner, it does cost extra money. So, um, and we'd be looking to do that on Thursdays if we open up on Thursday nights as well. So postage and delivery, $100, um, same amount telephone, our telephone and our internet, um, just under 6,000 of this is um, internet. Our internet is not the same as the towns um, and we are not filtered. For those of you who do not know, we are not filtered. Um, and we get a different rate because we're like a library. Um, so we're not running through the towns, through the town uh, quite the same way. However, our phone system does and we are looking at any point in time to move to voice over IP and anything, Kevin, that you can do to advocate for that would be wonderful. Um, and I have staff, we can't, we don't have a phone tree system. And I don't know if you've heard this from me, Kevin, so I'm just gonna plug it right now. <laughs> um, that I have staff who are answering the phone saying, yes, we're open. And that's the question. I mean, that's utterly ridiculous. I mean, staff time is being like wasted on, on phone calls that could be answered. What are your hours of operation? Hit one, hit two. We don't have that at all. Um, and so any, we, we would love to share that with the town <laughs> big time. Um, and we have handsets hand, hand that are literally falling apart. Um, and so Anything you can do to advocate for that, the library is 110% behind. So I'll just leave it there. Um, but Mike O'Neill did advise me just to keep the cost the same um, because right now I just pay a bill. That's all I do every quarter is I, or every couple months I pay a bill. Um, and if he wants to sign that bill instead of me, I'm happy to remove that from my budget. Like it's one less, my hand's tired, Kevin. <laughs> Give it to Mike. Um, but our internet would still be in this cost. Um, office- would there, Brooke, if I, would there be any um, savings in terms of if you consolidated with other departments within the town in terms of how we- I don't know what the savings really would be. Mike O'Neill could really speak to that, but um, in the spirit of shared services, we always the library always likes to be close enough to feel the warmth, but not so close that we get right. burned um and so but in this case to have a joint shared I, for me it's almost like an emergency reason it's our intercom system that barely works um but i think they've priced it out i don't know how much of a cost savings it would really be um but i feel like on staff time alone in my department and other departments a lot of questions can be like pre-programmed <laughs> answer the person's question you know it just yeah especially now that like with the with the hours still being kind of funky you know yeah. you get more now than you ever have yeah it, it's kind of similar to like when we, like the self-check system i mean it was one of those things that just changed things without you know while keeping staffing levels this you know that changes the just as an efficiency on that level as self-check right? it sounds like given how much time somebody's spending on the phone for questions I, that that 
could be answered with a button. Yeah. yeah. And I'm happy to talk to people I know on the town side. They're happy to talk with people and people want that conversation with a human. Um, and but a lot of stuff is like, are you open? <laughs> right. Yes, <laughs> we are. Come on in. And that's it. Um, seems kind of ridiculous. So um, yeah, and I feel like there is a cost savings for staff time towards that. Yeah. Okay. At least on the library, I won't speak with for other departments, but for mine, a little bit. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't even, yeah, you're right. I wasn't even thinking about that, but then it's like, you know, what's the appropriate way to quantify that? And that's real, where the real savings would be, right? Yeah. Um, office machinery services are, are, um, uh, are self-check um, and our, our, our RFID system. They quoted me the same price they did last year. Um, They're also reaching out to me um, because we're at end of life at this point, but I'm upgrading two self-check machines from Vista to Windows 10. Um, and, and, the, and the equipment is, is dated, but it works for the most part. Um, and over 50%, just to get to Martha's point on this, uh, over 50% of our, nearly 50% of our checkouts is through this, these two machines. You know, and that's a savings for the staff at the front circulation desk. But instead of staffing with two people, you can staff it with one. Um, and, you know, so that's, you know, but we're only utilizing half the functionality of RFID to begin with, um, but that's a capital improvement project if we want to go further. Um, and, and saves on repetitive use injuries too. I'm just going to throw that in. Oh, that's one of the ways we can help health insurance. <laughs> or workers comp, yes. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the same, but there's other vendors out there that would be a, a big uh, uh, our request for proposal kind of um, that we'd have to put out there. Um, our current company is Bibliothek. Um, repair and maintenance, we're keeping um, the same. Um, we haven't done a lot of repair and maintenance. So if you look at our current spent um, for this current year, it's quite, it's pretty low, 6%. We're quite low on that, um, but we just haven't had a lot of things to repair. Um, so that's where we are on that. Uh, specialized agency supplies, I took down by $1,500. This is barcodes, um, special tape that you put on the, the, the edge of the book. I did pull that down, you'll see why in a minute. Um, building materials and supplies, so this is light bulbs, ballast, um, some custodial supplies, um, you know, paper towels, but it also includes our PPE. And for this particular line, um, we are currently, I believe it's 100, yeah, 121% spent out in that line. Um, now, some of this, it's, it's, if it's PPE, it does get tagged as COVID. If the town is able to put in for reimbursement of any sort, they're doing it. Um, but I don't know if that's continuing after the new year, if that or this since January. I don't know if that's continuing, but we're still marking it as if something it, it could be. Um, so, but I don't know. We don't if there is any uh, money returned to the town for PPE. Um, it would not be directed back towards our department, but it would go back to the town. So there's that. Um, General office supplies, um, we're at 11,000. We're looking to drop that down to 9,000. We'll see if we're able to achieve that. Um, that's very concerning to my office manager, Elaine. And so, um, yes. And when I started here, that budget was at 15,000. So we're, we're trying to really tighten things up and I continue to tighten things up. So far, we've been okay. Um, Library books and other media. Um, we were, we're current year. We're at one hundred seventeen thousand. I'm looking to drop that by seven thousand, and we're not having the circ as much uh, circulating. I, I believe due to the pandemic, um, but we have other funds that we can utilize. Um, to spend on adult material specifically that we have already withdrawn, but we have not designated for this use. 
that we're sitting on. Um, so let's use it because that's the only use that it can be used for is like adult material or items for the Weathersfield history room. Um, so I did add the last time I asked to spend was for electronic resources, um, but I'll be looking to ask for money for just books and material to supplement this. We're also looking to reduce um, long term our nonfiction collection. People are not utilizing that those types of materials the same way they used to in the past. And for example, a biography, when people want some quick biographical information, more often than not, they're looking that up online, perhaps through one of our databases, they're getting the information they want, but they're not necessarily reading, you know, a two or 300 page biography. Um, and that doesn't mean we're not still buying biographies, but we're not perhaps buying as many as we had previously. Um, we have quite an extensive nonfiction collection. I think it's really, really important um, that we have that, but uh, we just, we're looking at a section recently of uh, books in the 300 through 369. And the, you know, there's like 15 books that have not circulated in 10 years. Wow. There's 60 books, over 60 books, I want to say 60 to 80 books, but at least 60 books that haven't circulated in eight years. Now, some of this stuff we're still going to want to keep because it's important for us to have whatever a particular title is. But if it's not moving, we need to keep it moving. Um, we need <laughs> fresh stock and we're still buying in the 300s and shelf space is a real thing. Um, so, um, but we're trying to really kind of uh, re really fine tune that collection. And the carts that we're going through, we've just pulled those, the 10 year list and the eight year list. And we have about at least three or four librarians going through going, should we put anything back? And so multiple experts are looking at this material going, oh, no, no, you can't get rid of that. But for the most part, we're agreeing on about 75 to 80 percent. Like we don't need this anymore. No one's looking at this. No one's asking for this. You know, let's make room for other, you know, newly published material. So that that's kind of what happens. So um, and, and we try to, you know, be very mindful of what whatever we might be getting rid of, um, but bringing in other good, good works as well. So. Um, that's what we're looking to reduce. And I'd say a lot of that from 117 to 110 is going to be probably in nonfiction. Um, and IT, I'm increasing by a few thousand dollars. We have to do a big conversion to Gmail, and that's going to cost money. Um, every account cost, I, I have some staff right now using um, not my full-time staff, but I have a handful of part-time staff that use their personal email accounts. And that's just not good in a municipal setting. It's FOIable. That's not the way we want to be. Um, and so we're looking to get everybody an account. Everybody's switched and transitioned. Um, and the system that we're currently using, there's memory issues. Everyone's using three, three, uh, there's not everyone, but there's staff are utilizing three different platforms to access the email system that we're using. Um, so we're looking just to transfer it all over, but we're trying not to lose any email in that process um, to make sure that we're transitioning it correctly and archiving what we need to archive um, and maintain that. So um, that's adding, uh, you know, that's, I'm anticipating that's gonna cost about five grand. And I'm looking to also purchase this fiscal year and next fiscal year, um, up-to-date laptops for rem any remote work we might be doing. Um, they work, um, but they're quite dated. Um, and so this, it's just not as quick as they need to be when it's taking, you know, 10 minutes for the computer, the laptop to even come on um, when it really should just come on. Um, so um, I'm looking to do some replacements there. Um, but we're not, we have a lot of stock of current stuff that we're looking to swap out um, on our public floor. 
Um, but we're not doing that because we're still trying to maintain social distancing for the foreseeable future. So I'm able to put out or postpone the replacement schedule a bit um, because that equipment just isn't being utilized and therefore it doesn't really need to be, re you know, replaced. And um, we just replaced two computers that were acting slower than usual and they were 10 and 12 years old and they served one or two specific functions for the staff in a certain work area and they were fine for 10 years or 12 years, one was 12 years, you know, and we've replaced those, but they didn't need to re be replaced till very recently. So we do put things off a bit. Um, and that's, those are very specific. They serve very small functions, um, but uh, we just replaced them and other staff were like, oh, okay, yeah, this is much quicker and better. <laughs> like, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's it for IT. Um, the below the line cost, is $301,174. It's a slight decrease of $2,500 from the current fiscal year. And so our grand total is $2,078,543, a difference of $17,121.25, which is an increase of 0.83%. So our increase is less than 1%. That increase is all coming above the line, the personnel uh, services. I like to blame health insurance always. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, and I think a lot of that actually is having to fund a full family on a, one of the positions. And so not necessarily an increase in health insurance itself. Um, so less than 1%, um, I had met with Michael Rell, um, and it was really, you know, early in the budget process in January. Um, I met with him like the day after our last board meeting, um, asking for any guidance or anything. And, um, and I think they hadn't really maybe fully met yet with his caucus or with the council to discuss it. Um, and so I said, well, without, you know, really knowing the direction the council wanted to go, the direction I was going to go in was to be as flat as a pancake as possible. Um, especially not knowing if there's going to be pay increases in a new union contract on July 1st. Um, so you just don't know what you don't know. <laughs> um, and you try to put a placeholder in there. Um, but that's, you know, that's kind of what we're, what we're looking at. So I don't know, Kevin, if you have any guidance from council at all, or if you guys haven't really seen the departments are still finalizing everything, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, we, we won't really get guidance until, um, the town manager consolidates, uh, all the different departments presents it to us with his uh, budget proposal. And then after that, kind of we really get going. So, okay. you know, we always uh, obviously appreciate you getting as close to, to zero as you possibly can. And although this is only my second go around in terms of budgeting with the town council, um, you do have, this board does have a the notoriety of keeping things like lean and mean. So we do appreciate that. So, that's what I'm don't have any does anyone have any questions for Brooke or comments on the budget? No. I, just, I wanted to make a comment. I just wanted to say maybe this is more for Mr. Hill when he reports back to town council. Um, this is my first budget year in Weathersfield, but in a past life, um, I was an official in another town where I dealt with the town budget, the board of ed budget, and I set the mill rate. And I can say with quite confident that so this board is um, very adept in regards to handling the budget and they've done a really great job in regards to keeping it flat and especially doing what they do with what they have. And, uh, you know, uh, Brooke does a great job and, you know, um, she deserves the kudos and, and I hope that you report back to the town about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, and I couldn't agree more and it's not, you know, when things do, when we start to kind of rob Peter to pay Paul in order to keep our bill rates down, it's never, you know, the library. It's always like the big, 
dollar figures like the you know the schools and basically it's people it's personnel that's the it's the number one driver as i'm sure you saw it in, in another town um you know it is what it is and um you know cost of goods and services go up every year um people cost more every year so that money has to come from somewhere so it's you know how do you shift it so but thank you i will do thank you amanda Amanda, you stole my thunder. I was going to, I was, and, so, and sorry, I, I was late. Everybody just, once again, kudos for, I mean, I think especially this year and the year, right, to sort of just take the same time you always do and so thorough during this process, just to really, you know, put together a really well thought out budget in, in a year where there's are still some unknowns. So I just wanted to say kudos and, and kudos to the finance committee too, to sort of, you know, kind of get to this point as well. So, oh, good job. Um, I, I'm just, I'll just again reiterate that you, you really have done a great job here. Um, I think as always, you've shown, you've worked to keep costs under control. You get, you have been very efficient um, in terms of the way you manage, um, especially the staff, you know, still maintaining our staff, um, but being able to keeping our services and hours and just the way, especially I know you do you're very magic with our 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 temp hours and um, keeping that. I think allows us to keep our, our full time hours. Um, I think it also reflects the um, changing ways that people use the library. Um, you know, your very thoughtful uh, take on our collection. I think people think of our library as a storehouse of books. It's anything but that. Um, it is the databases. It is the programs. It's a it's um, books that are meeting the current wants and needs of people, and and um, both educational and for um, you know uh, pleasure reading. Uh, so I think um, it just it reflects all of that. It's all there. So well done. All right. Um, anything else? Anyone? Uh, can I get a motion to? Um, what do we, we are accepting the, I have to go back to you're, you're voting on a preliminary. The preliminary, that's the word I was looking for. Preliminary proposed. Yeah. A motion to accept the preliminary um, proposed, the this preliminary proposed budget for 2122. Lori, so moved. <laughs> Is there, who's our second? I'll, I'll second, second it. Oh, sorry, Peter. We'll get Peter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, no other discussion? Okay, Hannah, I'm going to start with you down here. Yes, yes. Hi, yes. Hi, Peter. What's that? Uh, We're Peter. voting. Yes. Yes. <laughs> sorry. Right. George? Yes. Uh, Lori? Yes. Amanda? Yes. Michelle? Yes. And I am an I too. So thank you. And good job, Brooke. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Anything else for the good of the order? Um, please keep in mind, this could change and will. Yeah. <laughs> As departments are submitting things in, especially employee insurance goes up and down. Um, health insurance goes up and down. Uh, and pension will go up and down, workers' comp will go up and down. So there's a handful of things um, that will tickle, you know, kind of, and so I never know the budget till they're voting on it, like May 15th, and I'm like <laughs> writing the exact number, what do we get? Um, so they do, you know, they try to lock everything in and then, and then do the vote. Um, and uh, there's some dates, upcoming dates to be aware of, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, April 19th, Monday, April 19th is the 7 p.m. public hearing on the budget. Does that, Kevin's not even that sounds, that sounds about right, yeah. All right. It's um, a Monday. So, you know, uh, we don't want to overwhelm, <laughs> but it's always good to have a good showing. Um, so I know the friends will 
often will send a couple of reps to speak. Um, Martha generally speaks, um, but a couple of board members is, is always welcome. Um, but we don't want the night to go, you know, for hours either. Um, so, um, but it is, it is, it is helpful that council hears, um, and that's the time to really speak up. And then we have two upcoming governance committee meetings. One is Wednesday, March 24th at 6 p.m. And the other one is Wednesday, April 21st at 6 p.m. So if you, just the final plug, so George doesn't have to do it, if you like the nuts and bolts of policymaking, this is the meetings to do it in. Um, place to be. Yeah, it's the place to be. All right. Get your uh, tickets early. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we, there, we, there, we also get a one-on-one -on -one with town council to discuss the budget, um, which I doubt that's, that I know that has, won't, that'll be towards the, after April. Generally it's then. after April 19th. Yeah, after the 19th. And so, um, you know, everyone's welcome to join and Brooke makes this sort of similar presentation and gets questions from them. So if, we'll be talking about that on down the road. Okay, anything else? All right, well, thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Amanda I will say and... Where's my second? Peter. Oh, Laura. <laughs> okay, I th we have to vote. Michelle, you want to leave? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda. Yes. Lori. Yes. Hannah. Yes. <laughs> Peter. Yes. George. Yes. All right, and I'm a yes too. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Brooks. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. All right. We'll see have you next nice month night. or later uh, in the month. All right. Have a good one. Thanks.